Welcome everyone to Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. In pre-pandemic times, this pr weekly program was hosted at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library located in Oakland, California, USA. During the pandemic, we've been meeting every Sunday on Zoom. Please note that this session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube with a link on our website, icssmarks.org, within the next few days. Really, I should say good morning, good afternoon, maybe even good, good evening, because nowadays we have participants from all over the United States and all over the world in some cases. My name is Alan Miller. I'm a member of the program committee that organizes Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. And I'd like to start off by saying that we always welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics and speakers. You can sign up for email notifications for our meetings and contact us through our website at icssmarks.org. We want to remind everyone that this is a comradely forum for political discourse and debate. As such, we ask that you show respect for other participants and for the moderator of today's session. Also, please note that the opinions expressed here are those of the speaker and participants. They do not represent ICSS or the Marxist Library. They do not necessarily represent the uh, views of ICSS or the Marxist Library. One thing, however, is that we are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx, and we believe that his work remains relevant today. Our motto is taken from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Our session today is an open discussion on the war in Ukraine and the anti-war movement. The context for our discussion is that NATO countries are pumping billions of dollars into Ukraine, fueling a conflict that is edging dangerously towards nuclear war. There's tremendous controversy and splits within the anti-war movement, not only here in the US, but worldwide. Today, we wanna to focus on the politics and economics of the Ukraine war and how to build an effective mass anti-NATO, anti-war movement. In doing so, we wanna focus on three questions. Number one, what are the political, economic, and military factors that led to the war? Number two, who are the main forces in the anti-war movement? And number three, and most importantly, how to build the anti-war movement. Now, we know that these questions are very general and rather open-ended. We wanna encourage everyone here to contribute. In doing so, we wanna encourage you to keep your comments focused and on topic. Let's try to make this a discussion versus a series of individual comments and presentations. And to encourage this, we ask you to listen to others, be respectful, and try to respond to their questions and comments. Let's keep this a civil discussion to respect the participants and the moderator. So what I'd like to do is ask everybody to raise your hand uh, if you have uh, about five minutes or so to make comments, raise questions. Again, we wanna encourage people to engage in some dialogue back and forth and to turn this into really a discussion that gets at the heart of the issues. This is a little bit unusual today in that we don't have a, a scheduled speaker. It's really an open-ended discussion. So please go ahead and, uh, and uh, let's start. So let me pull up our participants window. And I didn't see how people put their hands up, but I'm gonna start off with uh, Raj Sahai, who has had his hand up for two days now. It must be very tired. We wanna give him a chance to put it down. He emailed me on, <laughs> on Friday that he wanted to make a comment. So Raj, you can put your hand down and uh, make your comment. My, my hand is very strong, thank you. Alan, um, so I'm going to uh, make a few comments about 
uh, why this conflict is happening. And I'll leave it to other speakers about uh, how to organize uh, opposition because I think there are others who are who have more experience than myself. I've participated, but not as much experience organizing them. So the in my opinion, the US has, which everybody knows has dominated the world economically, militarily, and culturally ever since the end of Second World War. Uh, that hegemony uh, in, other, in other words, it was a hegemonic power. That actually ended in 2009, particularly it became hegemonic from the, after the fall of the Soviet Union in 19, around 1990 and two events that Soviet Union fell and China uh, opened the door to world capital. So that ended, uh, that hegemony actually came to an end 2009 with the Great Recession, in my opinion. And at that point, it established China as a rival economic power. And hegemony consists of three things, economics, military, and cultural, in my opinion. And so the, in economy, there was a challenger now. The power restored in Russia after fall of Russia, after the 2004 onwards when Putin reorganized the state as it's along capitalist lines, but nevertheless, it, it uh, has a very strong state economy. Uh, so it is also a peculiar uh, state. Uh, that also he built military power because he saw the NATO encroaching encroachment going on despite the promise uh, to Gorbachev and ratified later on by, that was done originally by Reagan, but later on, but they, they basically said, okay, you can say whatever you like, we'll do it. Uh, so Russia was forced, Putin was forced to go into uh, uh, not only restoring economy, but also its military strength, which it was restored by 2018 or thereabouts. And so Russia uh, basically ended the unipolarity of American military power around that time. Now the battle on cultural hegemony, you know- uh, That's about two and a half minutes, Raj, so you're about halfway. Uh, no, I'm just on the first point. I'm gonna try and rush very uh, fast, but I probably need a little more time than five minutes. Or okay, you, go ahead uh, and uh, push it through. It's it, okay. It all right. So, battle on the cultural hegemony is started with the questioning of liberal bourgeois democracy, which is now completely a hollow shell. So, the second point I want to make is imperialism is a stage of capital, but imperialism cannot be enforced by capital alone, military power, but it is different today. And even the, it's a, a content. The dollar has no real backing. I mean, dollar backing is weakened weaken because they printed so many dollars. Keynesian management of the economy is no longer possible because, uh, first of all, over accumulation of capital, which resulted in, in, in its expansion globally, and now uh, integration of the world economy. So that's the second point. And uh, the so uh, United States is now seeing a uh, threat to its hegemony. And I see the US ruling class using Ukraine to weaken Russia and using Taiwan to weaken China. And this is rather a tall order, but that's their goal and how realistic it is. But the danger right now is without the war movement, uh, it can all become very dangerous. War could widen, nuclear weapons could be used. So I'll stop here. I have many points to make because I don't want to overstep my time limit. Uh, Thank you. I, I want to encourage people to comment as part of what you have to say on what others are saying. Raj raised some important points. So at some point, let's get into that. Okay. So um, Next, I'm going to take Gene, who's also had his hand up for two days, 
Uh, and then I think we'll follow that with James McFadden, Yusuf, and then Laura. Um, uh, okay, yeah, next, I, I'm on now. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, okay, go ahead. great. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion. What I want to do is read an extract from Marx, his inaugural address to the First International back in 1864, and then give a statement from my own organization, uh, Vets for Peace. And Marx said, how can the working classes emancipate themselves with a foreign policy in pursuit of criminal designs, playing on national prejudices, and squandering in piratical wars the people's blood and treasure. It was not the wisdom of the ruling classes, but the heroic resistance to their criminal folly by the working classes of England that saved the rest of Europe from plunging headlong into an infamous cr crusade for the perpetuation and propagation of slavery on the other side of the Atlantic. This has taught the working classes the duty to master themselves the mysteries of international politics, to watch the diplomatic acts of their respective governments, to counteract them if necessary by all means uh, in their power. The fight for such uh, for for a working class foreign policy forms part of the general struggle of the emancipation of the working classes. Proletarians of all nations unite. And that's what we have to learn from Marx, I think. And turning to um, veterans for peace, we are an educational and humanitarian humanitarian organization dedicated to the abolishment of war. Among other things, we work to restrain our government from intervening overtly and covertly in the internal affairs of other nations. Members of Vets for Peace maintain an organization that is both democratic and open with the understanding that we are all trusted to act in the best interests of the group for the national, um, uh, for the purpose of world peace. And our statement uh, on the crisis in Ukraine has four points. One, we urge everyone to read and study the joint statement of the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China on the international relations entering a new era and the global sustainable development which was issued on February 4th, 2022. And, and this is again where the concept of multipolarity was set forth by Russia and China. Uh, two, the US founded pro-Nazi Maidan revolution of 2014 constituted an existential threat to Russia. Three, uh, on February 24th, 2022, Russia announced a special military uh, operation to uh, demilitarize and denazify the Ukraine, not to attack the Ukrainian people. And four, our VFP position should be no proxy war in the Ukraine, bring our troops home, US out of Eurasia, and abolish NATO. That's who we are. And even though our national organization failed to endorse the Rage Against the Machine rally, our East Bay chapter did, and we believe that is the way forward. And so in the words of the great Frederick Douglass, the Black Liberation Leader, I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. So keep waging peace, comrades. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, let's go ahead to uh, James, followed by Yusuf, Laura, and Norma. And I think maybe the way to do this is if people have statements, go ahead and make them. At some point, I would like to shift this more to response and inter, 
you know, discussion between people. So, James, if you would go yeah. ahead and and um, got your time. Okay. Um, uh, thanks uh, for holding this forum. I, I normally am on a hike with my wife every Sunday morning, so I normally miss this. But um, um, uh, Ukraine has been like a, um, I fell down this Ukraine rabbit hole uh, a year and a half ago and it just like read constantly on this stuff um, from on the left, like Gray Zone and Consortium News to uh, to reading a lot in the uh, Council on Foreign Relations uh, Foreign Affairs magazine, just to try to get a sense. And I participate in several different forums, trying to get a sense of on the left and right. So, um, and I want to just say first, I, you know, for people who don't know about this, I really want to recommend a book by uh, Baldwin and Hartsong called um, Ukraine Zig Zigbee's Grand Chessboard and How the West Was Checkmated. It was written in 2015, so before the latest conflict, um, really, but after the coup. And it's especially uh, deals with uh, color revolutions, which I think is uh, important to understand. And I also would like to recommend, um, and I'll put, try to put these in the chat in a bit. There's a, a YouTube interview of French historian Emmanuel Todd. Uh, it's in French, so you gotta read the subtitles. It's a little long, but it's really, it provides kind of a, a, a good perspective, you know, outside, you know, of the US. And so, um, uh, so I've been trying to, uh, you know, get a good sense of this for, for, for a time. Um, and I think it's important to just kind of understand, you know, the, how you, the U.S. and everybody here probably knows this, U.S. is using privatization to destroy the economy and foment ethnic strife in Ukraine, you know, starting in the 90s, just like it did in Yugoslavia. And um, all that's to destroy social safety nets, the same was applied in Russia. However, you know, Putin began to put in place protections against this kind of corporate exploitation and the plans changed. And that seems to me that's when the agent pivot, you know, came in, which was either to coup, destroy or isolate Russia. And provoking an invasion of Ukraine became the plan when it became clear Russia under Putin was acting autonomously and beginning to integrate its economy with Europe. But I think the U.S. miscalculated thinking that Russia would quickly defeat Ukraine, resulting in Russia becoming uh, this global boogeyman, and that all of the EU economic ties would quickly end uh, with Russia, and that the U.S. NATO domination of, uh, of, of the European Union would be assured at little cost to NATO. And I think uh, the U.S predicted that, that Russia would do what we did in Iraq, we just go in and just completely destroy infrastructure and, and create horror in the rest of the world. But that's not what, what, what um, Russia did. It actually uh, uh, was somewhat restrained and, um, and instead we get a, uh, a, what seems to be a draining of NATO of its weapons, a, a flooding of the EU with refugees and if it continues, possibly a weakening long-term U.S. NATO domination of the EU, as it realized they're getting, you know, they're they're getting screwed by the U.S. And I think Emmanuel Todd, you know, says it west that this is this may be World War III, the beginnings of World War III, but you know, as a as a ground war, not as a nuclear war, which we normally think of. And he he talks about it as being as What's really happened is Germany is once again defeated. It's prevented from integrating in economically with Russia. And he thinks Germany was the primary US target, not Russia, since a German dominated EU with cheap Russian energy represented a threat to US economic hegemony. And you can talk here, Ray McGovern talks about this. And he says that, you know, Olaf Scholz acts as a kind of epitome of an abused spouse standing there while. Uh, Joe Biden says he's going to end, you know, end Nord Stream. So I think there's, there's really a, um, this UX proxy war is really to prevent any autonomy and sovereignty of US European colonies, I think, and I think that's the right way to think about it. The, the Europe is, is basically treated now as a colony and, um, and, uh, and, and it's being used to help fund the twin deficits, you know, the trade and budget deficits as uh, Michael Hudson uh, outlines. And I think this Asian pivot is also about isolating autonomous countries like China and Russia who refuse to comply with US neoliberal policy 
which is about U.S. multinational corporations, you know, uh, being able to exploit the world. So uh, there's one other aspect, and that's that there's kind of a, a neocon arrogance that's uh, and racist hatred of Russians that also seems to be playing a secondary role, mostly in, its, I think, it's blinding the Biden administration to the consequences of their actions and making some of them actually think Ukraine can win, which is total nonsense. And uh, unfortunately, the American public, as they did with WMD, seems to be totally fooled by the corporate media. So I'm uh, um, not sure how this can all get kind of turned around. Um, that's that's five minutes. Um, thanks. James, can I ask you, that was very, very clear, really a very clear presentation. While while others are talking, can you jot down some notes? We'd like to hear your comments on the anti-war movement, some of the developments in the split. So we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Next up is Yusuf. Uh, okay, I will like to thank the uh, previous speakers uh, for their um, excellent uh, uh, comments in uh, analyzing the uh, global situation. Um, I would put it that um, uh, United Na Russia, P Putin, and so on and so forth represent the more national uh, 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 Russian bourgeoisie rather uh, 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 than uh, those who uh, would ca capitulate entirely to uh, imperialism, but nevertheless, uh, 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 Russia is still a capitalist uh, state. Um, after a, as the Soviet Union weakened, and in fact, before it's just before its collapse, U.S. policy has um, uh, uh, has sort of a, not uh, before, during the Cold War, uh, a, it was the primary target was socialism. And um, uh, so any uh, uh, anti-socialist capitalist formation uh, was uh, uh, supported. Um, he, uh, starting with the war in Iraq, this uh, uh, changed that local, uh, uh, powers and uh, the later on the more serious uh, rival of Russia uh, and including China and also China, although China uh, is still basically socialist, I maintain, um, uh, uh, have been uh, 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 targets of uh, US imperialism and no rival. And also uh, 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 I thoroughly agree uh, this whole thing is a matter to um, um, uh, weaken uh, Europe as well. This is one of the uh, main objectives of this current proxy war. Um, unfortunately, some of the uh, a, my uh, comrades uh, in um, uh, various peace organizations um, I, uh, have not been able to make it, let me, um, a, we speak some, we, my view and also uh, the view of uh, uh, some of the organizations like the Western New Haven Peace Council, uh, a part of the US uh, Peace Council uh, on some of the views on the uh, anti-war movement. Uh, we, why there are uh, concerning the uh, uh, previous, um, the February demonstration in uh, Washington, uh, we did not endorse it uh, because we did not want to lend our name in a uh, demonstration that uh, one of the principles are uh, people we very much loathe. Uh, they are racist, uh, these libertarians. Uh, They're not for cutting the, um, the uh, as part of overall we have fiscal policy, they view it, but that does not mean that by cutting the war, the war budget, they will uh, uh, give it to human needs. They are also against that. So, uh, but I think people who uh, attend the, those um, demonstration, I also respect and support. Yes, as individuals, I think it was very good of them to go. 
but I would, uh, uh, I was, uh, our organization and as well as my opinion was not to lend our name in such a formation. Um, how to build the um, and <coughs> war movement, I think we have to um, involve uh, 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 people, uh, groups outside the traditional left, uh, because we don't want to speak just to ourselves. Um, although it's good to speak to ourselves, uh, but we have also uh, find ways to draw people from environmental movement, from the African-American community, from uh, workers uh, and so on. Such uh, 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 classes of people and organization are uh, uh, drawing them, I think is uh, very much essential and we should not be just speaking to ourselves. So that's uh, basically my, uh, my thoughts maybe uh, later I, I could answer questions or we have further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, I would uh, note that Yusuf uh, brought up the subject of whether or not to endorse the February 19th demonstration. And I would encourage people to comment on that because I think it's a real pivotal question in terms of this debate over the anti-war movement. So we can come back to that. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Laura, Norma, and then Janet. So Laura, go ahead and um, take the floor. Okay. The there are at least two existential threats going on and what and the military action in ukraine is worsening both of them one of them is nuclear annihilation and the other is the climate there is nothing about the military that is good for the climate everything that the that powers the military destroys the environment both by design and through the uh, the manufacture and, and use of the weapons. Um, and I wanted, but I wanted to say a thing about where the greens are and they're all over the place. Um, there are greens who want the U S to send arms to Ukraine. There are greens who want to uh, join in on peace movements, but only with the usual allies. And so it's not just greens, it's, you know, across the whole left and there are Greens that want to join peace movements, whatever the allies, include all allies. And I would put myself in that third group. It's like anti-war. If you're anti-war, I don't care if your main thing is anti-tax or whatever, go for anti-war. Um, but I think that one of the things I really think is a huge problem a couple of things it is humans follow leaders and make enemies. And it's the easiest thing in the world to turn somebody into a villain and then line up everybody against that person. You know, that's what they're done with Putin, Hitler, Saddam Hussein. You know, they can flip people from one side to the other um, in Panama, in Latin America. And it seems like even within the left, within myself, it's easier to, to uh, build up energy to, um, I started to think that the way, if you want to grow something, focus on getting rid of somebody, G-R-O, get rid of, and in an email thread, for example, once you start talking about how bad somebody is, everybody piles on. But you talk about, hey, let's do this project, and you might not get anything back. But um, it's, I mean, it happened with Nader. Nader turned from hero to villain because it helped the two party system to vilify him. Um, I'll never forget going, I think it was um, a lot of what I have learned about how the world works. It comes from being a Latin American solidarity activist and having gone to Latin America a number of times. And partly I went there because there was hope there. They had, um, they were standing up against the imperialist and successfully. And one of the things, Hugo Chavez, by the way, died 10 years ago. I'm gonna send out a blog about his, um, 
10 things I learned from Hugo Chavez, but one of the big things is he connected with people and he connected with people that otherwise you might call enemies. Colombia was always opposed to him and had military bases. It's a neighbor of Venezuela. He would go and talk to Uribe or whoever was the president at the time. Now they've got the first progressive in 30 or 70 years, some long period of time. But he would talk to people and he knew that nobody, Hugo Chavez, Venezuela, no country, nobody can stand against the power of the imperialists alone. So he was constantly connecting, 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 connecting. And his legacy 10 years later has made a big difference. I'm probably running out of time. <laughs> I'm probably over. But, Go ahead, another minute. Go ahead. Okay. So 10 years later, there are countries like Brazil and uh, Bolivia and Argentina and Chile, you know, who lost the what was called the pink tide toward socialism, not socialist, but toward there, um, lost ground, but have come back. And that's because so of those connections that were made across Latin America about trade and about health care, about peace about communications and all of media and all of that and so it's like stop if we can stop following insane sociopathic leaders and stop making enemies i, I i'll close with just appreciation appreciating how succinctly raj put that the u.s is using the ukraine against russia and is using taiwan against china and that to me is sort of a bottom line to the whole thing so it sounds to me like you were really emphasizing the need for broad unity, and that's part of your motivation for supporting the February nineteenth. Uh, I think it was demonstration. absolutely, and there there yeah. are a bunch of greens there. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, next up is Norma, followed by Janet, followed by Richard, followed by Sharon. So go ahead, Norma, unmute yourself. Coming off of Sharon's input about Phyllis Bennis being encouraging about any anti-war action, about all the peace, any peace demonstration being useful, valuable, necessary. Thank you, Phyllis Bennis. Very good. Um, a, a, a little while ago, a few weeks ago, Biden walked away from some consultation and uh, Putin was on the other side someplace that I didn't keep. But Biden was saying, kind of muttering out loud uh, something about nuclear conflict. And then after that, Putin said, well, Russia will have to respond in kind. So it's not Putin who started this again. You know, and it is illegal, you know, uh, according to UN agreements, to use to waive the nuclear threat in regard to conflict. Also, uh, well, we've had to, as the, Laura said, make a monster out of Putin. Pe people don't read what Putin writes because he's so crazy. What's he crazy about? He's still talking in a revolutionary language, uh, Marx. Uh, undergirded language, which is totally unclear to us on the other side. And which is totally clear to me because I, I revere the Russian revolution of 110 years ago, which is what is being fought all over the world since then by the imperialist forces. And that's what this is part of. Uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, had, I, I, I believe the news that I've chosen that uh, Ukraine threw out a Soviet or, or Russian allied leader and so forth, and, a con and then a continued a persecution of a group of people who were declared themselves Russian and had tried to use a populist behavior to vote to divorce themselves from being assaulted constantly. Uh, 
and didn't succeed. And the assault continued. And that's what finally drove Putin to say, you know, I'm amassing forces on the front on the front line. I'm amassing forces on the front line. Don't do that. I'm amassing. And then finally to invade. So Putin's fight has been clearly against the 110 year old attack on the Bolshevik revolution, which has frightened our owners to death. They can't stand how afraid they are of communism, of people uprising, which has been, you know, totally right. The, uh, communism is creeping in everywhere <laughs> in spite of calling it uh, capitalist. They're not capitalists. They're looking for the chance to reinstitute their socialist and communist struggles. Uh, and that uh, they have resorted, uh, Russia in particular, but China, they resorted to capitalism because they've had to get along. And you know that as well as I do. And we've refused to allow, oh, they're not being socialist and all that kind of crap. The left has assented to. Um, also, uh, if I could ask James McFadden, welcome. <laughs> Um, you commented something about colonialism by the U.S., that, that that's a factor, a feature in the argument. I would like to talk with you about that. I, I would like to I don't, post my name and number in the chat, and you and I have a, an ear-to-mouth explanation of what you were saying. You said a lot of a lot of things that I don't know about, and... Uh, Anyway, if we could get to that, at least from uh, from you and me talking together, I'd appreciate doing that. Yeah, I would encourage people welcome to ask others questions uh, in the group. Um, let's go to next to uh, Janet. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so I'm not hearing uh, the Nazi element in Ukraine being addressed in terms of mm -hmm. history. And uh, I'm not gonna go into it, but I'm, I'm just raising it because it's something that's fundamental to Russia's SMO, special military occupation, uh, I'm sorry, operation. Um, and, you know, their history uh, going back, you know, the second world war or what they call the great patriotic war and Ukraine's role in it. Um, or you know, I'm not hearing the, the need to understand Russia's, Russia's point of view in terms of what to do. Um, and Norma just touched on some of this, uh, the need to listen to what Russia says and does. Um, uh, and also the, the West is not winning a military war there, um, but has so far been pretty successful in waging a major propaganda war, which needs to be addressed. Um, in any case, I argue that those of us interested in peace, and that's a term that needs to be defined. People throw around that word all the time. What does it mean? Um, or are anti-war. And I tend to believe that the use of physical force and armed, conf uh, armed conflict is an extension of human physical force, is hardwired into human DNA when threatened. Uh, some people you know, uh, want to end war. Well, I don't think that's uh, likely or possible. Um, um, other animal species use uh, physical force uh, in, in their own way. Um, anyway, um, one moment, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I Okay, so I think um, that um, there is a need to approach this by understanding that we can't stop the military conflict that began over Ukraine regardless of which side uh, we may think is on the right side of history. Um, I, I agree with Scott Ritter on this, uh, where he talks about the conflict of Ukraine 
uh, over Ukraine will resolve itself. And what the so-called anti-war movement needs to do is whatever it can to reduce further harm and damage like dismantle NATO and push for arms control and nuclear disarmament. And I believe we'll hear more on this from Scott when he's here on the weekend of March 18th and 19th. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, just a quick clarification. Uh, Scott is doing an East Bay tour. March 8th, he'll be in town March 18th and 19th, including an appearance in downtown Oakland at Oak Stop and uh, on Saturday. And then on Sunday, he's going to be appearing in person at the uh, Marxist Library for our Sunday morning session. So uh, put that on your calendar. That's going to be a good one. Thank you, Janet. Uh, next up is uh, Richard. Janet, if you would drop the uh, leaflet URL in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Richard? All right, would you? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, first off, I've already sent out a couple of notifications of Scott's um, uh, address. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to pick up on, on well, originally I was going to talk, I, I had some points I was going to talk about, and originally it was going to be sort of addressing uh, what, uh, what Janet brought up was about the uh, propaganda. Uh, I think there's some, been some serious damage done to um are uh, to the to the media, which is supposed to be acting as a as a check on government, not as a not as a megaphone for government. Um, but what I really wanted to um, get to, to and, and this is going to hurt some hurt some feelings, I'm afraid, uh, is what I call the uh, Deus ex machina um, uh, uh, phenomena that seems to be going around. Um, and of, of which, in fact, I was uh, a part of, uh, you know, uh, and, and, when, and when I went down to Nicaragua and, and I supported the Cuban Revolution and, and, and all that. Uh, the deus ex machina phenomena that I'm picking up on is, seems to be people that are, are, um, are hoping for help from outside of ourselves. Um, so, for example, I've seen people, you know, um, uh, uh, rooting on uh, China getting involved in negotiations because China will solve our problems. Um, or they're rooting on, uh, you know, the early on uh, the uh, uh, Zelensky um, was actually meeting with Russian uh, and people were rooting on that because that was them solving the problems. Um, what we really seems to me, what we really need to recognize is that the problem is here, uh, and that we cannot, we cannot hope, we cannot look upon uh, outsiders to solve our problems uh, in this country. And specifically, our problems are, um, for the better part of two hundred years, we've been we've been at war with with neighbors. Um, Everywhere, <laughs> I mean, it's it's incredible, uh, you know. And people still, you know, out there in, in mainstream America, America still think of us as being the the uh, the city on the shining hill. That's just simply a myth, and it's a wrong myth. And we really need to get back to, I mean, I mean, after all this 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 whole the thing that sparked this open open discussion was. Um, who now uh, counter uh, counter demonstrations, um, both happening within, uh, both being put together pretty damn quickly, although I will say late, uh, and uh, and 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 so we need to build on that. We need to we need to start looking at what we can do to get outside of our own little our own little um, our own little silos. And break those things down, and and uh, you know, get out and talk to people about why we're the problem, how we get out of NATO, how we stop being an imperial uh, uh, country, uh, how we how we transform 
right now, I think there's all but like a half a dozen congressional districts have military contractors in them. We need to address that. We need to, you know, we, I mean, in fact, it was addressed at some point, um, you know, so, so, okay. Uh, having said that, I will shut up and, and maybe I've just started a slow discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next is uh, Sharon, if you would uh, go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Um, I agree with you, Richard. Um, I want to make two points. My first point is that um, I think that you don't have to be pro-Putin to be anti-U.S. imperialism and anti against the proxy war. So I think it is a proxy war, and I think we need to build a, a movement in this country against U.S. Imperialist, imperialism and against NATO. But I think that Putin made a mistake, and that it's unfortunate, and it's costing the lives of thousands of young Russians, as well as thousands of young Ukrainians. And um, I could say more about that, but I, that would be a tangent. My main point would would be that I agree with Laura that. An anti-war means anti-war. It doesn't mean a whole list of other things. And the left has always talked about building a popular front, building a united front. And I think a lot of us don't understand what that means, has meant historically. So the Marxist view of what that what those fronts are is that a popular front is a broad front of people that are united around a small number of things. In fact, in this case, one thing, being against US proxy, waging a proxy war in Ukraine. The idea of a united front is that the progressive forces, the left, would center, would be the center and core of such a popular front. So it is arguable that the libertarians are not such a are not of the left and they're centering the peace movement is wrong and therefore we shouldn't support that. But I say we need to fight to get to be the center of a popular front and the only way to do that is to participate in the popular front and try to win leadership. So for example, it, it, I think it's a good thing that there was a demonstration called Rage Against the War Machine. And I'm sorry, we didn't think of it first, but that slogan, I mean. But given that they were having such a demonstration, peace groups that are centered by the left, progressive groups, should have demanded more, and uh, maybe they did, I don't know, but should have demanded to have more participation in the leadership. And I think that the United National Anti-War Coalition, which is having a demonstration in Washington on, I think it's March 18th, should invite the libertarians to join in the, in the leadership, not be the leadership, but to join to make a united front, uh, uh, to, to be the center of a popular front. And I hope I, I, I think, I, I, I hope I was clear about that. But in any case, I believe that we need to go to any, any anti-war demonstration that there is and bring our own information and whatever like Vets for Peace has done, bring our own point of view and, and interact with the people who are there. That's the only way to build, to build the peace movement is to have events like that. And not, it doesn't always have to be demonstrations, of course, forums and everything else. Any other tactic is to build, the, to educate people is is very important but and so thank you laura for for raising that and i'm sorry the greens are not more united 
Okay. Um, next up is Mehmet followed by uh, Kit and Rich. And I want to make a transition here after, well, then we have Citizen One, but I'd like to start transitioning soon towards people commenting. We're about halfway done commenting on some of the questions and perspectives that have already been raised. So uh, why don't you go ahead, Mehmet, and um, say your piece, and then hopefully we'll, in a couple of uh, minutes, we'll start shifting that way. Go ahead, Mehmet. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yes, I think uh, we can see the shift that's already happening, especially with, uh, you know, Richard Wright and then Sharon bringing up really important uh, questions that go to the heart of the issue. Uh, the Whatever we do, we have to, yes, we have to be the core, the united front, uh, the leftist, Marxist, Leninists coming together to form the alternative. And then we can join or not join or work with the others for peace. Yes, we can do that. Uh, but and we should do that. But I'm seeing that even in the left, there are splits that is going on that's affecting the way to oppose the war. And uh, uh, I believe in the core of that is the all remnants of the left uh, appearing, uh, you know, showing itself again. Remember in the 1970s and so, we would have the social imperialism uh, coming up in some circles that show uh, that uh, defended that social imperialism, the emerging imperialism was the number one uh, enemy. And so the number one enemy for them was Soviet Union. The other imperialism was the uh, you know, the uh, imperialism that was going down, but the new imperialism emerging was the Soviet Union. We see that that parallels itself today in our discussions as Russia being the imperialist. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, we need to, we need to address these and many other, uh, you know, topics that come out from the left we have to address these. Uh, all of the concerns that come up are addressable. They are very easy actually to address, but uh, we, we need to go into those and go into debate to maybe solidify our stance. And then once we have that strong core, then yes, like Sharon mentioned, we, uh, war is an economic democratic demand. Yes, we do make, uh, uh, we do come together with those who are not Marxist Leninists, with the liberals, with this and that, for a subject like the war. Uh, this happened in the First World War II. In the Second World War II, people were, uh, you know, in the First World War were against it, and they joined forces with the others who just didn't want to go to war. The Vietnam War was the same thing. It doesn't have to be a leftist. But one thing that needs to be discussed is this. Is this an inter-imperialist war or is this an attack of imperialism to some other capitalist country? I would like to propose the second where the imperial US imperialism on its decline has become more dangerous and is now attacking because it is losing ground. And so it will and is attacking any rival capitalist country like uh, Russia, like, uh, like uh, China, uh, that will come as the next. So let us work on these and the questions that are being brought by others to, to paint Russia as the emerging or is the imperialist center. And we, we, we can go on from there. Let's, uh, let me remind you that Russia's GDP is close to the very small country of Portugal, in Europe. So that's what it is. If you're uh, attempting to tell me that Russia is an imperialist country, let's start from that point and then extend whether uh, this is an um, inter-imperialist war or an imperialist attack. One more thing, uh, closing down, is saying that we have to distinguish between just wars and unjust wars. And there are claims from the left that Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin and Marx were all against the war. But the, this is a 
yes, I understand this is a principled approach, but the other thing is that as Marxists, we don't go into hypothetical or abstract principles. We do see that there is an imperialism that is attacking countries. Yes, we are for class war, of course, class war, but this war is a class war attacking those who do not toe the line of imperialism. And we supported Iraqi uh, liberation war against imperialism, Libya, Vietnam, Afghanistan, for being independent or uh, resisting against imperialism. So now the attack has turned into yet another capitalist country, Russia. So yes, we are against the war, we are. But in order to stop the war, uh, stop the uh, environmental destruction, stop the you know thousands of people being uh, killed, then we need to stop imperialism attacking other countries. I'll talk more on that later. Thank you. Exactly five minutes. Thank you, Mehmet. Very good. Um, next up would be uh, Kit and Rich. It's followed Kit. <laughs> oh, okay, Kit. And okay. followed by uh, Citizen One. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Go ahead. Okay, Kit. thank you. Thank you very much for this discussion. I think this is a very important meeting for us to have is, uh, in, in terms of organizing ourselves and uh, uh, different forces that are out there. Um, and I, I agree with what folks are saying here in many ways. Um, and in terms of organizing, I think we do have to cast the net wide um, and see who out there supports our position um, about Ukraine and also um, you know, going to places that we normally may not want to even go to. Um, I unfortunately am going to be missing Scott Ritter next week. I unfortunately didn't have the dates right in my calendar for this, uh, but I'm going to another event, which is um, not going to be uh, where the left is hanging out. And I will be encountering uh, people of diverse uh, political persuasions, but who and who are libertarians and who are um, uh, open to different ideas. Um, and I think it's important to go to places like that where we are forced to dialogue with, with uh, individuals that uh, we normally wouldn't, wouldn't do. Otherwise we won't know what's going on out there. Um, I th I'm gonna be doing a lot of SI at this um, conference in the social investigation uh, to figure out who's who and where people stand on, on the issue um, because it's gonna come up. Um, and this is a place where, you know, people are interested in what the military is doing. Um, so, and what the government is doing, but there's a tendency for anti-government, you know, rhetoric too in this uh, place where I'm going. Um, so, Anyway, that's that's one thing I'll be doing. I do agree. We need to talk to our families, our friends. Go get, get on social media. Uh, you uh, start organizing among uh, friends, comrades, allies who are uh, who share our opinions. Because uh, I I think some folks are kind of out there on their own. Uh, not everyone's totally organized. So I'm really sorry I'm going to miss Scott Ritter even at Oak uh, Oakstock because it's in our area uh, neighborhood. Um, you know, it's, but, you know, I hope other folks will go. Um, I will probably go to as many other events as possible. Um, um, but yeah, again, like the issue about COVID makes it difficult, but I'm taking a chance going to this other event next week. So um, anyway, I, I don't want to take up a whole lot of time. I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but yeah, we need to talk to people, educate, and uh, repeat what the U.S. historical position has been on political um, issues and uh, intervention and imperialism. A lot of people just don't know it. They forget about it conveniently and whatever. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Citizen of the Planet One. Go yes, ahead. Citizen of the Planet One, Joseph Anderson here. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Okay, I just want to do a sound check. Um, I just want to interject. Uh, someone said Putin made a mistake, and I wish they had explained why. 
because I don't believe Putin made a mistake. Uh, what I wanted to contribute to this uh, discussion, and excuse me, I'm late. I actually went to Nebel Proctor Library and <laughs> before I realized this was only going to be online. I thought it was going to be both. Anyway, what I'd like to contribute to this is that, um, you know, I've, I've spoken with uh, Medea Benjamin a number of times over email and Cynthia Paper Master and Davey D and a professor who was recently on Mitch Jesuits' show, Stephen Kinzer, and a guy from the uh, Quincy Institute. I, I had a very polite conversation with them, but I regard them as just a bunch of Cold War liberals, um, Cold War liberal war mongers at that. What I'd like to contribute is that I think that the messaging that I've heard about why people should come out and demonstrate is kind of off the mark. Uh, you know, a lot of people like my friend Medea and Cynthia uh, and even uh, this uh, Stephen Kinzer have been trying to scare people about a nuclear war. And the average person, if you go out there today, I mean, if these are the people you'd like to have at a demonstration, the average person is not worried about a nuclear war. Uh, it's not imminent. We've lived with the threat of nuclear war for decades. People are like, been there, done that, you know. Uh, I'm going to worry about my day-to-day -day living over a nuclear war. And I think people are more worried about inflation. And I don't think that this rampant inflation, you know, watering uh, home heating prices and, uh, you know, uh, gasoline, everything. I don't think that this inflation, uh, rampant inflation, has been linked to this war the way it should. And in my humble opinion, it's two things that might get people out into the street connecting this war to the inflation. This is one way that ordinary people, working people are paying for this war. The other way I think uh, could be connected to trying to get ordinary people in the street is to talk about the tens of billions of dollars being spent. And today, at least what you hear on the mainstream news, it's like a hundred billion. So we know it's more than that. This might end up being another trillion dollar war. This kind of money is being spent while SNAP is being cut, which benefits mostly poor children. This kind of money is being spent while school lunches are being cut or parents are being, you know, lower income parents are being charged for school lunches. Uh, some, even according to the mainstream news, are behind hundreds of dollars on school lunches that should be free in the first place, especially for lower income neighborhoods. And so um, I feel these are connections that are not being made that actually affect working people. You know, it affects me, but, you know, I can swing it. But I mean, I have to think twice about where I drive, you know, my car. Um, I, I, I'm going to wrap it up short for sake of other people. But I mean, fortunately, I live in a neighborhood where I can walk to everything I need. So my car can stay in the, in the garage for a week at a time. What about people who have to take their kids to school? What about people who can't get to grocery stores, you know, with, without their car? So, um, I, and I, the other thing I believe is a mistake is, you know, condemning Russia, in my humble opinion, Putin made a mistake. Um, you know, if, if, we're going to condemn Russia for something that, frankly, it had to do. I can explain that later if someone wants me to. Then why should anyone be against a proxy war? So anyway, this is what I'd like to contribute to, to this, to trying to actually get out in the street. Uh, the people talking about nuclear war, in my opinion, that's going nowhere except for those of us in the choir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I also, I especially want to thank you for commenting on other people's comments. I want to try to encourage that more. Let's go to Richard Giovanni, who hasn't spoken yet. And then we're going to cycle back through among people who have. But again, I want people to really uh, focus a lot on things that have been raised. Some of the questions that have come up are uh, whether we should have supported the February 9th, 19th rally, and whether we should uh, unite with groups like the Libertarians and the anti-war movement, uh, whether the uh, uh, the Russian military intervention was a mistake, or as if some have condemned it as an illegal but understandable provocation. 
And I think that what um, I think it was James just brought up about how can we motivate people to uh, uh, support the anti-war, anti-NATO demonstrations. So go ahead, Richard, if you would go ahead and um, make your comment and we'll go from there. Yeah, Richard? okay. My last name is actually jo pronounced Giovanoni, but uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm from uh, Chicago land, uh, actually a Green Party National Committee member and also on the editorial board of uh, Marxism Leninism Today website. Um, so in terms of the, uh, I know uh, Laura had mentioned the Green Party. Uh, actually, it was, I was one of the ones that voted not to formally endorse the uh, February 19th uh, demonstration. Because at that point, it was clear that uh, the Libertarians, the People's Party, and were pretty well in charge of the demo. I believe we should have taken a position more like the Veterans for Peace nationally did. Is It was too divisive to actually vote on it. Uh, and they let individual ones like East Bay, uh, VFP and stuff endorsed. That's that would have been fine. And I think people should have went there and spoke and Green should have show up at the demos, but at the demo. But uh, I'm not sure we should have formally uh, endorsed it. It ended up costing us three uh, steering committee members who because of the, their younger, you know, a little bit more of the uh, council culture that uh, believes you don't uh, associate with people who are, you know, considered homophobic, transphobic, even though, you know, us older people know you have to fight to, you know, convince white workers against racism and things like that, that you have to be out there and mixing it up and uh, dealing with uh, people of all different stratas. Uh, I know I sent $35 to uh, Tulsi Gabbard in 2020 just because she was going to raise the uh, issue in the Democratic uh, a party uh, primary about the, about you know the endless wars, not because I thought that she was uh, a necessarily a progressive person on, on all issues. So I think you have to, but it was obviously Bernie Sanders and uh, 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 Elizabeth Warren were not going to be cr that critical of the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, so that's uh, part of the thing. So I think you have to be out there and engaging with. Uh, you know, people of all stratas. Uh, but I, I do think it was a mistake for the Green Party nationally to formally endorse it uh, at that late a date. Did they endorse the February 19th? Or, uh, I'm a yeah, little well, a, a plurality did. It was, I can't remember the exact numbers, and maybe Laura, I, you know, it was uh, a lot of people abstained. So we added the abstains and the people who voted no. Uh, it was maybe like, uh, I think the people who voted for it were only like 40 some percent uh, or, you know, so it was very much divided. And of course, we have the embarrassment of having Howie Hawkins, uh, our 20, at least in my opinion, 2020 candidate uh, is one that supports the U.S. sending uh, arms to uh, to the Ukraine, even though I agree much more with what Sharon said about Putin making a mistake actually going in at that point. I know that they were provoking him and uh he, I think he went and did what they wanted him to do. Right. Which I don't think has been helpful for either the Russian or the Ukrainian working class. Oh. Okay. Um, let oh. me um, go ahead. Let's let's call on Sharad. He hasn't spoken yet. Sharad, if you would go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for uh, for having this. Um, so there. A few things that I wanted to to address because I think the questions came up earlier, like why why is uh, uh, there so little opposition to to this war, and uh, nobody has addressed the question of of how this this war has been uh, uh, portrayed uh, through the through the media. But I think it's really unique uh, in the sense that uh, with with other wars. Um, the the um, yeah I mean the Vietnam War the, the war in Iraq I mean it's, it's this I'm talking about from a U.S. perspective so it's kind of a U.S. centric view but uh, the war in, in Afghanistan the U.S. was the was the external aggressor and uh, so the the views of these wars were were all seen through the through the eyes of uh, of U.S. troops and and U.S. allies in in, the, in these countries. And uh, in the Ukraine war, we have, we have you know we're, is a, we're the daily bombardment with uh, interviews 
of um, Ukrainians who are, who are under bombardment. And it's really being seen from the, from the eyes of the, of the, the victims of war uh, on one side. And uh, it's, it's so comprehensive that, that you know, there's, there's, no other, there's no other narrative. So uh, in that sense, it's very different. And I think that that is what is um, uh, prevented uh, opposition uh, to, to the war. And I find this, you know, even in academia, usually in academia, you, there's, there's some, there's some uh, debate, there's some difference of opinion and uh, maybe it's the, the, the particular circles that I'm going to. I go regularly to to, to Stanford to uh, to see uh, you know seminars uh, about the Ukraine war as well as other global issues. But but this is one where there's there's just no divergence of, of opinion, and that uh, it, it institutes like. I'm not talking about Hoover. I'm talking about like CDDRL, the Center for for um, de de Democracy and Development. Uh, uh, you know, Larry Diamond's uh, uh, center, Francis Fukuyama, and um, th there, there's there's no questioning of of the war. There's no questioning. I mean, e even you know earlier before the war started, questions about about NATO, and there was no questioning about, you know, why does NATO still exist after the collapse of the, of the Warsaw Pact? Um, but anyway, I, I, th I think it's, it's tied to the, to the, the portrayal of the, uh, of the war, uh, particularly, uh, you know, after the war of, uh, of being through the, the eyes of the victims and also because these victims are, are for the first time are white. And uh, about, um, about the issue of, of neo Nazis, the you know the, the, I, I hear I hear you know two uh, opposing voices. One saying that okay, the Russia is is, uh, is uh, acting militarily because of the to try to crush the the, the uh, neo Nazis in in Ukraine, and, and on the other hand. The West is saying, "Well, that, that's ridiculous because because uh, Zelensky is Jewish." Jewish. And <laughs> it, 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 these two <laughs> these two <laughs> positions fail to to uh, you know to differentiate between a government that is more or less right, okay, but it but it is also providing a, an umbrella for for the neo Nazis. And, it, and it's very similar to, you know, Trump was not a proud boy, but he was providing an umbrella for the proud, for the proud boys. Narendra Modi in India is, is not, a, he's a product of the RSS, right? The, 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 the Hindutva militia, um, but, but, but he is not him, himself the, you know, the, the, the forward fighter for 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 Hindu violence, but he provides an umbrella for that, and it's the same thing in Ukraine that that the yeah. Ukrainian government headed by Zelensky is is the same government that that incorporated the Azov Battalion in, in 2014 into the Ukrainian National Guard, but it's not. That's five minutes. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I just want to note that uh, Sharat raised two important questions that haven't come up before, which is number one, uh, how do we explain the the level of support or what is the level of support in the U.S. for the NATO uh, war? And the second one that he raised is um, what is the involvement of uh, neo-Nazis or Nazism in the Ukraine uh, war situation. If people can address those, that would be great. I'm going to go to Raj, and then I'm going to go to Janet. So, Raj, go ahead. And yeah, let's try to I keep these less than five minutes. Let's, yeah, let's keep them. Yeah, I'll yeah. keep it short. So, first okay. of all, I agree with Joseph's comment that way to generate support for the war, uh, anti-war movement, is to connect it to ordinary people's lives that are being 
uh, so much affected by U.S. war machine and its way the capitalist economy functions now. Very speculative, a lot of money made on the Wall Street for rich people, but what happens to the poor? They're paying the price through increased costs in, in daily life. The other point I want to make is the, yeah, I don't agree that it's a Putin's mistake. In fact, Putin's first movement was only to bring them to the uh, table, and he didn't use the force to dis highly destructive force. But then it was sabotaged. So I think no matter what Putin does, they will keep on pushing. They'll put nuclear weapons in Ukraine in order to uh, put pressure on Putin to do something. And so I think the whole thing is, I think the idea of J what James McFadden was saying, there's some truth in it, but Germany is a, cannot, is the, uh, alone is not a competitor of the United States. The point is that German and Russian integration is the threat. In other words, Russian, if Russia and Germany combine, and then there's China, then there's a challenge. So that's the point. And uh, finally, I think uh, the idea, uh, and I'm thankful to Sharon for clarifying the popular, uh, popular mobilization, the popular uh, versus United Front. And I think it's important that we maintain our position, but we support everybody who is opposed to this war. Uh, and I, here I disagree with Joseph, the danger of nuclear war is there, not because they intend to, there are unintended consequences of two powerful, both sides see it existential. For Russia is existential in survival of Russia. For America is existential in it's losing its hegemony. So it's elite here. So that's the danger. Anyway, that's those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, Janet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Sharat, uh, yeah, good to see you. It's been a while. Um, I talked about, uh, I, I had talked about it being a propaganda war which is kind of what you were referring to. And thank you for expanding on it. And sadly, KPFA mostly takes the State Department point of view. Um, I, I'm curious what you meant by gov government that is more or less right. I, um, you were talking about Ukraine. I think um, Ukraine is one of the most, if not the most corrupt governments in the world. And, um, the, the, the Zelensky regime came out of the 2014 Maidan coup, which also hasn't been brought up here. But anyway, um, um, responding to Joseph, um, I agree with the impact domestically. Uh, I also think wars are a, a, a domestic uh, or a bonanza for the arms industry. They don't care which side wins or <laughs> loses. Um, but nuclear war is something to be worried about, given all the arms control, arms control treaties. And, and could somebody mute? I think. Thank you. Um, the the U.S. has withdrawn from all these treaties, and uh, uh, there's no control. You know, the START treaty is is about to. Uh, End and probably won't, uh, couldn't be renewed in time. Um, so there's no controls in place. Uh, it's it's uh, really, really bad. Uh, Scott Ritter sees this as, as the number one issue. Uh, and he should know based on his history with the INF Treaty and uh, being an inspector in, in the Soviet Union, a weapons inspector. Um, uh, to Kit, you keep on talking about Scott Ritter being here next week. It's not next week, and I don't know whether you mean Two next week. or whatever, but it's on the 18th and 19th, so I don't, I don't know what your plans are for, but not... Uh, it, I, I'm talking about Kit, right. So uh, she was saying next week, uh, but it's in two weeks, yes. Um, so I agree with Mehmet uh, that the U.S. is desperate to maintain its hegemony. 
And it will take desperate measures, including possibly using, I mean, the only way the US could win, quote, win um, in Ukraine is the use of nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, the United States is the only country that used them before and has been kind of using them. Um, I think they're called tactical weapons. I don't know, if, um, as well. Um, not, uh, you know, in, in Iraq and elsewhere. Um, Sharon, yes, I, I also would like to know what mistake you think Putin made, if it was about starting the special military op uh, operation. Uh, what uh, I'd like to know, what alternative did Russia have? And I'd like, you know, it's like, what what could they have done? Just, you know, let it happen. And, you know, just uh, what has been happening with the growth of NATO, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they put their foot down. I think the, uh, the United States needs um, to have some of that against it. Um, and as far as Sharon, also the uh, you talked about a united front um, uh, being about the proxy war against Ukraine. I think it should not be limited to that. Um, there's an ex existential threat to mankind around the possible use of nuclear weapons, uh, more immediate than climate change. Although a nuclear war would bring about nuclear winter. But anyway, um, it's got to be broader than just Ukraine. I'll stop okay. there. Okay, let me uh, let me ask Sharat to briefly comment, since Janet commented on your comment, if you could briefly comment on what she said and ask for clarification if needed. And then Sharon, if you would respond to what Janet has said. And Susan, we'll get to you, I promise, as quickly as we can. So Sharat, do, would you want to? Go ahead and uh, respond. But I, you can I'm, raise I'm, a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm not sure there's there's a, there's a, a call to uh, there's a need to to respond to it. But I mean, I think you're talking about the you know why there's so little opposition to the to the war. I, I'll add to it by saying that that uh, I mean one factor, and I think it's a minor factor, but nevertheless it is a factor that that this is a war that is uh, started. Uh, I mean, started in the sense that the U.S. is the is the main provocation that 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 led you know to to the current war that uh, that we accuse Russia of, of uh, having invaded, but it's the it's the U.S. ultimately that is behind uh, NATO and and uh, the, the provocation. Uh, and uh, but the other factor is is uh, it is the fact that it's being started you know, under a democratic president. And so there's, there's, there's very little negative reaction from, from the, the, the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And uh, you know, we, it was the same pattern with the, like the, the, the Women's March. The Women's March was huge when, when Trump got elected. As soon as Biden came in, it's just, it just reduced to a whimper. So uh, uh, that, that, that is one of the, mm -hmm. the realities of, of US politics. As far as uh, I didn't address about, uh, about the, uh, the uh, uniting you know, with uh, groups that we don't really agree with like the libertarians, but you know, it's, I, I think there has to be uh, uh, united fronts with, with organizations that uh, you know, where we, where we are focused on, you know, a, a very specific, very narrow issue uh, that that um, that we should be able to unite, you know, with at a certain, you know, a certain level. It's not that we agree on everything. It's not that we unite, but we but we unite on on the specific issue of of opposition to the war, recognize, recognizing that the U.S. was the primary provoker of of this war and that we have to take responsibility for that. Yeah, uh, Sharon, if you would unmute and uh, uh, respond, comment. Well, I'd rather hear from other people who haven't had a chance to speak yet, but uh, let me just say that I, I am not, not in favor of the anti-war movement going, or, going around saying that Russia, that Russia made a mistake. I'm just saying that I think they did. And 
uh, speaking internally to we who are uh, opposed to U.S. imperialism. And I'll, just one more thing. As a member of the international working class, I cannot, I personally am not in favor of sending the Russian working class into war. I think that um, if we really support the all those of us internationally who support Russia and think that it was that they had to do what they've done, we should be organizing an international brigade to fight with them. And short of that, I think we're talking about fighting to the last Russian. And I won't, I can't personally be in favor of that. Okay, Susan, um, if you would go ahead and unmute. Hi, everyone. We um, can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, I have a few things to say and questions for people who um, made statements earlier <clears throat> about various left groups. Um, I am in DSA, and DSA is part of a large coalition called Peace in Ukraine, which is centered by Code Pink and Vets for Peace and many, many peace groups around the country. Um, people in, you know, in their localities have been doing different actions around the country. Uh, Joseph Anderson had uh, not kind words for Medea, and I would like to understand that. His, you know, his, his view of that and other people's too, Medea Benjamin from Code Pink. Um, so, Peace in Ukraine initially uh, endorsed the Washington demonstration uh, um, in February and then pulled out. DSA never endorsed it. Vets for Peace never endorsed it. I'm not saying that I, I don't have a, a personal position about that, but I do know that efforts were made by these groups to communicate with the with the libertarians. I don't know about the peace. The, um, People's Party, but they um, refused to have any discussion and people did not endorse or pulled out because of a lot of right wing stuff that became apparent to people when speakers were announced, right wing speakers. And I don't understand the Libertarian Party, blah, 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 but I'm more interested in unity on the left. So in and I live in Oakland, so I'm paying attention to Oakland and San Francisco. So now um, what's happening is that two nationwide groups, ANSWER and UNAC, which are not the same and don't always work together, are um, involved uh, called in the March 18th demonstration in Washington and in San Francisco, and they, um, they they initiated those two, not UNAC. UNAC is public, publicizing it vastly and making it look like they initiated it, but they didn't. And I know that you know I know those groups, and uh, I am likely to support the demonstration in San Francisco on Saturday the 18th, which unfortunately um, conflicts with the Scott Ritter thing, but that's not the issue. The issue is what do people know about ANSWER and UNAC and what do they think of them? Because they have, both of those groups have consistently done anti-imperialist and anti-war work for at least 20 years. And um, so that that's my question to the group. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. Citizen of the Planet One, you uh, were asked to comment on this, and others who perhaps have answers or comments to to Susan's point. Joseph, are you still there? Yes, I am. Am I? Can unmuted? you? Do, do you feel okay about commenting? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. First of all, I just typed in a chat that, to my awareness, I didn't say anything unkind about Medea, and if Susan believes I had, uh, I wish she would have stated what it was. Um, so the other thing uh, I, I put in the chat, 
And uh, well, well, first of all, excuse me for, I've got a bunch of notes here, excuse me. But um, so that is my comment to Susan. Um, my response to Raj and Janet, I appreciate what they said about the possibility of nuclear war. I too, as I think I put in a chat, I, I too believe that that is definitely a potential possibility. Um, in fact, I think the only thing that, that might, uh, well, not the only thing, because there are demonstrations in Europe. I heard there were 50,000 people who demonstrated in Germany very recently. But uh, outside of my knowledge of that, I thought maybe the only thing that might bring the West to its senses is, uh, you know, a, a nuclear weapon landing on European soil for the first time, because uh, Russia might be pushed into that corner if the West keeps uh, pushing advanced weapons into Ukraine. Um, so, yes, I certainly believe that that's a distinct possibility. I, I see Laura's there. I wish she had gotten a chance, Laura Wells. I wish she had gotten a chance to comment before you called on me, but uh, so be it. Um, I'm just saying, trying to scare people into the streets, trying to scare ordinary people into protesting over nuclear war will not work. And I, I very politely and kindly told my longtime friend Medea Benjamin through emails that we've actually exchanged that I don't believe that that will work. And I also told that to Cynthia Papermaster, who I'm, I'm on uh, friendly terms with. So um, one thing that uh, Janet said, and I certainly agree, and I'm, I missed uh, saying this, but I didn't want to go for five minutes anyway, that the other thing to, uh, uh, you know, Janet spoke about that, uh, in my words, I don't remember her words exactly, but that this is uh, to feed the military industrial complex. And those are, uh, that is also one of the things that I would use in my messaging to ordinary people, that this war is for two reasons. One, to continue to hugely feed the military industrial complex, the U.S. military industrial complex, of course, and therefore the 1% because the military industrial comp complex largely comprises the 1%. And the other reason for this war uh, is to force Western Europe to buy nat natural gas from the US fossil fuel industry. And uh, I don't know how Europe has been fooled into not realizing it, but as I told a journalist friend of mine in uh, England, you know, Europe's getting the refugees. The U.S. is getting the riches. How can yeah. they stand? How can they stand for that? Um, I, I just one itching thing I have to say before, and and please let me know when my time is up. You know, well, Germany, if you can, maybe one more quick comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, if I may make it two very brief ones. Bernie has revealed himself to be a phony, and I've long felt that the purpose of Bernie is to keep people corralled and to keep progressives corralled into the Democrat Party. Bernie has been parroting the U.S. government on this war. He parroted the U.S. government on Venezuela and other things. And I would say the same thing about AOC, the squad, other congressional progressives. The last thing I will say is that uh, people should read the article at Black Agenda Report. No, I don't have a, a about the libertarian. I guess they sponsored this whole this the libertarian party was you know the people who sponsored or whatever uh, this whole rally. Um, so I don't have a background on the article. At face value, the article is a very damning article, and to tell people of color that they should take a back seat to a party that, according to the Black Agenda Report article, has supported all these racist things. You know, that's been done so many times before. And I told Madea, I said, if you speak, and I don't object to you speaking, but condemn the Libertarian Party for its, its racist attitude. It's turned Trumpster, uh, as, as far as I can tell. And the other thing, if the Libertarians want to have their rally, let them have their own rally. They claim to have all these people. And the rest of us who believe in anti-racism and, and you know anti-homophobia and all these other kind of things, we can have our rally. We all don't have to be like all at one rally at one time. Better to have multiple rallies. Thank you.
Okay, Susan, just very briefly, did you have a uh, something you wanted to say real briefly in response? You have your hand up. You were mentioned. Yes. Um, Go ahead. This is briefly. back to Joseph. Um, yeah. Thank you for mentioning the Black Agenda Report article. I, I know a lot about the background. Um, I, I, I wrote down Medea, Cynthia, Cold War liberals. No, did you misheard I, that. Did I misunderstand? Yeah. That? No, I was talking about the, the people at the Quincy Institute that Chris Welch has been having on her show all the time. And, and these are all Cold War liberal warmongers. And I don't know why Chris Welch doesn't have someone who's actually anti-proxy war on her show instead of these Cold War liberals from the Quincy Institute. So I, I'm sorry, you misheard me. Okay. Um, Laura, since you've you've come up a couple of times, <laughs> you have a right to respond. You have to unmute though for us to hear you. Okay. Um, one, uh, I think I strongly believe that how to build an anti-war movement, as a matter of fact, any movement is to it, to connect as many people as possible. And if it's one issue that you agree with, then connect on that issue, go to the anti-war rally and all of that. On February 18, among the people who were there, at least in the lineup, I know Chris Hedges and Jill Stein spoke, and I think Cynthia McKinney as well. You know, there were other people um, who spoke in Washington, DC on February 18 at the Rage Against the War Machine. And I and find that, you know, some people didn't want to go there, didn't agree and all of that stuff. But I personally am happy when anybody gets, you know, connects, as I as I was saying before, the. Um, there will be uh, the Green Party, Greens, uh, you know, it was mentioned Howie Hawkins is in the camp of uh, send arms to help Ukraine. And Jill Stein is in the camp of, she spoke at the February 18. Um, so she's in the big, you know, con connect everybody. Um, we are, the Green Party of Alameda County has Green Sundays. Now it's on Zoom, so anybody can be on it. I will post in the chat um, how there, that there will be on April, what's the second April, April 9th. Jill Stein, who was the presidential nominee for the Green Party in 20, uh, 2012 and 2016, will be there with Howie Hawkins, who was the presidential um, candidate in uh, 2020. And they're on the, these two different sides about how to, you know, what to do about the Ukraine situation. So that's going to be on April 9th. I'll also put in some information that, that Nicaragua, which is another interesting place where there are progressive who are very much against Daniel Ortega. And yet, the and and people who are very much in favor of the things that he has accomplished in Nicaragua um, in his both in his first presidency and since he's been back in 2007. Um, there's going to be a Green Sunday in one week um, at 5 p.m. on Zoom for uh, 5 p.m. Pacific on Nicaragua. So I'll put that information in there as well. And I want to and, and I want to say that the peace movement, we need a peace movement, you know, within the left. And there are so many things that people can do. Not everybody likes to do everything, but just to give a quick list, you know, rallies, electoral work, lawsuits, lobbying your representatives. For example, you are never going to find me doing that. I mean, rarely, because it's too irritating for me. I can't do it, but other people can do it. And it sometimes is effective. You can, they can be turned around sometimes. Um, you can write stuff, alternative media, uh, internet, meditation, um, citizens councils, direct democracy, one-on-one. -on -one. Some people say that's the only thing that's actually going to work, go one-on-one. -on -one. And it, that's scares me to death, but the and and local community projects like community gardens, international solidarity, every single one of them, there are people that say, well, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, don't do that, do this. Do what, what is in us to do. 
toward the world that we want. And I just think that that's how you build the movement. That's why we don't build a movement is that we we have some kind of hurdles that people have to jump in order to be in solidarity with us. And, I, and also I wanna say, of course, individual actions are terrific, but it's solidarity. It's when we can stand together as humans um, that I think is really vitally important. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call on um, Richard Fallenbaum, who hasn't spoken yet. So, Richard, if you would go ahead and unmute and make your comment, please. You're muted. You're still muted. Richard? You got to unmute. I thought I'd unmute it. There you go. Okay. You're okay. Um, um, I, think, oh, I think we need to get a hold of this concept of, and internalize it about how the current situation is different from the ones in the past uh, related to the peace, quote unquote, peace movement without going into what is the peace movement. Basically, in the past, the, the, the peace movement has been based, has um, either tactically or basically um, accepted the character of US imperialism and struggled for reforms. Uh, and when we, 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 and because of the, either because strategically it was impossible to, 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 to um, contemplate the demise of US imperialism or because people just couldn't, were not a, opposed to US imperialism fundamentally, they just wanted re reforms in it. But now we're in a situation, an existential crisis for US imperialism, for, the, for US society, for the US state. And, um, you know, if we didn't, if we didn't uh, know it, sense it originally, uh, Russia and China have made it explicit for us. You know, they, they, their project is not just the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, their, their project is the demilitarization and the equivalent of the denaz denazification of US imperialism. And that's a existential question. And so um, we need, you know, the, the, new, the, the new peace movement, quote unquote, that will emerge will be different from the old ones because we're, we're talking about dismantling the United States as we know it today um, and replacing it. It's, it's basically revolutionary. Uh, it's not necessarily a socialist revolution, but it's a revolutionary transformation. That's the issue on the table. It will, um, about, I, I don't want to get into the, all the discussions of these demonstrations, who should be involved and who should not be involved and so forth. But we have to recognize that there is um, a mass opposition to the war involving millions of people, tens of millions coming from the so-called right, the MAGA right, if you will, the MAGA right, the uh, um, Trump who says he's who's against the war. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was against the war for whatever reason. These are, there's, there's, there is at least as many of those as there are of the progressive anti-war people. So they can't be dismissed anyway. Um, and I think people, you know, people say, well, we should be in the leadership. Well, we're not in the leadership. They're in the leadership right now because there's more of them. There's millions more of them. You know, Trump got almost a half the vote both times. So, and I'll leave it there. Okay, we're we're getting very close to the end at 1230. I'm gonna ask Jean, if uh, those of you who I call on coming up, if you could just keep it to about a minute, that'd be great. We'll get a couple of people in, and then we'll wrap it up. Jean? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I'm really proud of this group. 
and the discussion has been so fertile, it's difficult for me to follow everything, and I'm glad it's being recorded. So I want to thank everybody for being here. And I just note, that I was going to say that if you go north on Interstate 25 from Colorado Springs, you'll pass the uh, Air Force Academy and a big sign that says, peace is our profession. And uh, I think that's an important thing that, that the peace, they consider themselves perhaps part of the peace movement, which is kind of maybe strange. But the other thing is about uh, in, in nuclear weapons, you know, it said, well, thank God nuclear weapons have not been used since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, I think it's Daniel Ellsberg that uh, uh, had pointed out that nuclear weapons have been used consistently by the Uni United States as an integral part of our foreign policy to threaten non-nuclear enemies uh, as well. And that has forced the Soviet Union and China and Mao, when he got the, when he decided to, uh, he said, we have to have this thing, nuclear weapons, if we don't want to be bullied. And now they have their new nuclear arsenal, but they have a pledge that they will never, under any circumstances, initiate a nuclear war. And they keep their weapons on, they don't have launch on warning. They have them, uh, you know, they won't respond. They will respond, but they won't uh, 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 initiate a nuclear war. And I think that's a lesson that uh, is worth learning. But again, thanks, everybody, for this, such a great discussion. Thank you. Uh, Yusuf, if you would quick comment, just a minute. Yusuf, unmute. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Um, well, let me make it clear. There are various ways of supporting it, uh, lending your name is one way or endorsing it is one way and but the that's not sometimes uh, carries with it on bad consequences but uh, I for one voted uh, for uh, Biden uh, because I found it tactically necessary but I, I would never endorse him endorsing is a different matter um, so that was the position concerning the uh, February demonstration. If you want to go, go, fine. If you want to talk with libertarians, fine. But lending an organization's name into that uh, is a different matter. Let me correct um, uh, Janet on a technical point. Um, the uh, US didn't use uh, tactical nuclear weapons as of yet. Um, it used uranium tipped uh, uh, artillery uh, for its armor piercing properties, but this has um, an environmental consequences. That's just about the radiation, but it's not a nuclear explosion, it's not involved. Uh, and thank you, uh, Eugene. You made uh, uh, very good comments. Uh, we, your last comments uh, were particularly very nice. Uh, and concerning Russia, uh, well, that's a matter for the uh, uh, working class forces in um, a, 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 we, we, within Russia. Let them be made it. We are not in. Russia physically, we're not part of it. We're not in touch with the uh, working class in Russia. So it's not uh, up to us uh, for uh, bringing it up. And also uh, thank you, Norm, for the last comment. I uh, found uh, the participation uh, uh, of Chris Hedges a red flag also. A, a red warning flag, not the uh, red flag. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, thank you, that's all. Okay, and then um, we'll go to Kit and hey, then uh, Richard Wright. Quick comments, because we have to wrap up and I have to say a few words at the end. So go ahead, Kit. Okay, uh, this is Rich from Kit and Rich. Uh, thank you, I'll try to be brief. I just wanted to affirm uh, uh, references, direct or indirect, uh, when Joseph spoke, uh, and particularly bringing up the uh, 
uh, I'm talking about Black Agenda Report. Uh, this was a particular article, but I would recommend people uh, tune up, you know, get hooked up to Black Agenda Report and try to read their articles often. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, I don't think it's been spoken to directly, but it's been inferred a couple of times, and that is uh, building a united front that Sharon talked about, uh, uh, not versus, but uh, the, the concept of it, uh, uh, which is different than a popular front, at least in the traditional sense uh, where it's been used. Okay, so my point is that uh, I, I have to say, sadly, that I am not in tune with any kind of uh, anti-war activity that's going on in the African-American and, and even the Latino uh, um, communities in general, in the Bay Area in particular. But I think the point is that uh, when we build a try to build a united front as defined by Sharon, as uh, mentioned by Sharon, uh, that we realize uh, the necessity to build that uh, united front with, uh, she talked about uh, political uh, allies, political, uh, and, and I'm saying in general, uh, cultural uh, and on the street, people that we need in the front uh, that determine uh, which way the front goes, how it appeals to people. And I, I wanna say personally, uh, thank you, Joseph, for showing up again, because we haven't been doing in general programs at the library. I thought it was really cool that you tried to go by there and find us, but uh, I, I know your voice. I know your name. I remember meeting you, having you speak, uh, have, you having spoken at the library. So I uh, thank you for showing up um, and uh, saying the things you did. I think they could be expanded a little bit. It would be very good for our group. Uh, and I think we should reach out and make alliances with the people that we need on the street in general. Yeah, Rich, we got to move on. on. Thank I you. I made my point. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, uh, Richard Wright, if you have a 30-second comment, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, well, I, originally I raised my hand because I wanted to broach another subject. I'll just say that I thought today's discussion was very good. Obviously, it's uh, foreshortened. Um, we need to vi revisit this some more. Um, and I'll just uh, shut up after, from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things. Um, next week, we have uh, Jean Rule speaking on the uh, transition of uh, the role of labor in the transition from ape to man, an anthropology lecture from a distinguished anthropologist uh, professor. So please tune into that. In uh, two weeks, we will have Scott Ritter live and in uh, the Nebel Proctor Library. So Joseph, you can come in two weeks and we will definitely be here. And I encourage everybody to come in two weeks to the library. Also on Saturday, Scott Ritter will be speaking at Oak Stop. And the uh, leaflet for that was uh, posted, the URL for the leaflet was posted in the chat. Um, just by way of wrapping up here, I wanna say, I think it was a very good discussion. I think the strong point of the discussion is that most of the important issues were raised in the discussion. And uh, the way I would sum it up is that uh, I think, um, for example, Raj really brought up a very broad context for what's going on. And others address that question too, in terms of the war in Ukraine. Um, I think that many people made good comments about the different perspectives on the left. Um, I think it needs to really come out more sharply uh, I don't think it really came out uh, clearly enough, but there are very different perspectives and how people feel about uniting uh, uh, with non-progressive uh, forces necessarily uh, and the February 19th uh, demonstration. Um, the question of how to regard the Russian uh, activity in uh, Ukraine, whether it was a mistake, an illegal uh, invasion or self-defense, something that should be supported and the defeat of NATO being supported. And then finally, the um, motivation and how to reach people for uh, to build this movement. I think that we need more discussion about that too. So.
Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di- directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.